Yeah, well, uh, let's start. So, I mean, we've got a good week left. I think we can do some exciting regarding microcontrollers and mm -hmm. automation and, uh, yeah, microcontrollers applied to hydraulics. I actually got a, an MCU. It's a little wireless MCU. It's, it's coming today, too. Um, we can do, like, we can get go crazy and do up to that. But, but I mean, the basic idea there is, okay, we, we have the capacity to, to automate, like, so with simple microcontroller scripts on Arduino, using what we're, you know, the Arduino Mega, what we have already. We have a complete system that's developed for the controller itself for the brick press. So, I mean, the valuable thing would be understanding, well, how do you go from, okay, I'm going to give it a command, run this cylinder and all that, how do you actually control uh, real devices to do to do whatever you want? Because for the brick pressing, I mean, we've done that manually. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, we start with the levers. I mean, you have three ways to go. First, you got this big lever that you do it actually physical cinema ram press. You press five of those, and you're like, no more. <laughs> um, then that's why we went to the. I mean, we had that. We actually borrowed that from a university, and I literally pressed like two bricks, and I said, no, <laughs> I'm not gonna be doing this. Um, so tried that, and then so then we go to the a hydraulic CB press back. What was that? 2008. And yeah, I mean, you have to be there. You're the operator. You're doing. You can do like. You know up to like five bricks per minute or so like four you know four three to four comfortably five if you're really really in there um but yeah i mean so so yeah that's a person that has to be there just to do that and it gets kind of old and boring so that's a definite good case okay how do we let's just put that on a microcontroller and say okay move the cylinder here move it there move it there and you've got a little bit of feedback so in the system the current system that we have we've got a pressure controller a pressure switch it's a sensor pressure sensor it's connected into the hydraulics you just screw that into the hydraulic lines on the high pressure side and you observe okay well, you're moving the cylinder well when it bottoms out it gets all the pressure because it can't get no more and then so the, pr the pressure switch triggers so that's an example of a very simple on off device just like we have the for example the thermistors they actually read you the temperature through the code so you can have feedback but but in the brick press all we got is a pressure sensor and we say okay when we bottom out we know we got to reverse direction and then we got to go so far and, and for the both cylinders so so that pressure switch is connected to it's basically uh, like right in front of the valves so that if you bottom out on either cylinder you feel high pressure right there because dip you know continuity of fluid the fluid flows uh, if you have no resistance it's like the pressure drop is negligible once you bottom out a cylinder, the pressure spikes way up, you know, to your 2,500 psi pounds per square inch. So it's the regular pressure of the hydraulics we use. I mean, we're running the the pumps we we have. They they go to 3,000 psi. So we got 3,000. So you think about it. Okay, I'm I got a little cylinder that's pressing. Well, if you have fluid at 3,000 psi, that wants every square inch you got. You got pushing with 3,000 pounds. I mean, that is some significant stuff. So an entire uh, five-inch cylinder, pi r squared, that number turns out to be like 20 tons altogether. So 40,000 or so pounds because you've got that much volume uh, area, surface area of fluid, then you're pressing up and stuff like that. So um, the force is there, you know, and then with very subtle signals and just lines of code, we say, okay, we control that amount of force. Uh, very simply with the microcontrollers, so that's that's what we can do. For the brick press, there's a flow sequence, like you know, you've got effectively like you've got soil that's in the hopper, you've got a intermediate a cylinder that's the drawer. It's a, it's called a soil loading drawer. So a thing that basically opens up the compression chamber. So it basically slides back and forth. It opens up the compression chamber, closes it. You compress open it, eject, and press that brick out as the next next uh, soil drop. So, so there's like a few motions there. There's a very particular logic sequence. What's the volume of the soil versus the brick? Uh, you compress it down to two, about two to one. So you start with about uh, eight by six by 12. So the six by 12 is the, the flat face of the block. 
six by twelve gets compressed to four you start with about eight inches so that the chamber is like eight inches deep it compresses to four and at that point you've got block that are uh, we took some measurements they're like 700 psi strong uh, those are like plain unstabilized block we measured that long ago like 20 I mean 2009 or 10 uh, that's the kind of numbers we get but what's that mean like uh, Adobe like a construction method of Adobe they do like 300 psi that's their blocks for building homes we have 600 out of the box if you stabilize it with some cement it goes up to about we measured things like 1100 psi if you stabilize but yeah plenty of strength like you imagine like what's a psi every inch every square inch of that brick and there's six times twelve seventy two square inches but each each square inch can hold like seven hundred pounds that's a lot uh, are these bricks hot when they come out these are these bricks no they're not not they're hot. hot they're just no, no they're just uh, there's no fr it's like they just compress no it doesn't heat up it's it just kind of compresses that's You're all leave them to sit for a while though right there's two ways like we we did raw block straight into a wall but they will settle like at the end of the day they'll settle like three quarter inches like at the very top ones because there's some moisture and the moisture evaporating from the block will actually settle very little per block but if you've got you know eight feet wall you'll get like an in, about an what inch about, of settling. Is it would be possible to use like a dehydrator to you can you can't really dehydrate. speed up that process I mean it's uh, it might like you, you actually want them to dry very slowly, otherwise they'll crack. So do you, you think want it, it makes more sense to build the bricks offsite usually because of that? Uh, it depends how you want to do it because offsite that means you've got huge transportation costs. Yes, that is more controlled because we go to Kansas City. I don't even know if there's maybe there's some like ordinances that say oh you can't even like dig a pond in your backyard or something because that's what we would either use that for no but probably not because people dig out basements what they do with that soil you, so that would be a perfect case to do it on site but you would have to have the right soil like you might have to truck in soil so you, you have uh, quality control issues there but I mean I would I would do it straight from the ground if the build technique allows for that setting so for example uh, you lay you lay a, like a brick wall you know, who cares that it settles like an inch right like a block wall so that's a definite okay yeah you can do that but say you're uh, you're gonna put a top plate on it um, you have to be careful like how it's gonna settle around windows if you don't have any windows if it's like a little bunker yeah you could just build it fresh it'll just settle but who's gonna notice um, but depends on your situation I'd like to see it where we develop techniques like even if you have windows you can allow provisions where you know say you just I don't know however you do it make sure that when you fit the window you either like put it in later or do it somehow that you don't need to, you, you're okay with the thing just that setting if you got wet block unstabilized block now with the unstabilized block what you gotta be careful about is rain because they're if they're not stabilized they're, they're not waterproof so that's why you want to add the cement that's why the when we say CB here it's stabilized with some cement like 5% cement and then you're waterproof and then when you uh, press them offside they're not gonna like destroy get Why destroyed if there's rain. Over just pure, like, lime? Uh, different different qualities of soil determine how much lime and cement you you could use for best stabilization some people stabilize with plain lime some stabilize with cement and depends like on the clay versus sand content of of your block so it and that's once again like this material science stuff where the devil's in the details like maybe for some block it will actually work better with with just plain lime uh, and it depends on up to what PSI and stuff like that so there's there's details there it's on the soil composition because I mean there's all kinds of different clays there's all kinds of mixtures of how much I mean other particles like like small pebbles or or sand so so clay is actually clay is not does not refer to like the material type as much as particle size because uh, you because we call clay anything that's super super fine very very fine then you go up to silt which is a little rougher than sand kind of like you recognize sand you can see the grains clearly for clays I mean you, you can't hardly see the can't really see the particles they're very small but you go up to silt sand and then gravel and then rock but 
Uh, clay could be that, that same rock that's just pulverized super, super fine. It's, so, so, I mean, it depends how you define clay, but clay refers, from what I understand, more to the particle size rather than the composition. So you can have different kinds of clays. Um, so, well, uh, so, I mean, what's the best use of our time um, in terms of the, the next week? So we can uh, take out the, the microcontrollers. We have the components to build the exact controller that we use today. The way it works, we just put a have a selector switch there. We switch it to one. One is full block. Two is like half block. Three is like whatever, three quarter block. And then uh, another selection is just to prime it, just uh, basically reset. So we've got the selector switch. Uh, and then we have an Arduino to it and then connect it to the whole hydraulic system through solenoid valves, mm -hmm. which are the high pressure. These are these uh, large things, the pressure sustaining things. Those are the things we turn on, just like the gas solenoid on a torch table, which is like a small thing that just turns on gas at low pressures. Uh, here we've got these sizable solenoids because they are very they're rated for 3000 psi they got to have enough meat on them to hold that um, but through the microcontroller uh, and a little board which is a relay mm. the relay so this is the board there's the relay that's next to the board and that's what's giving the couple of amps like two amps at 12 volts for the actual solenoids uh, Are you so that kind of system yeah, when we have that, we have a power cube on hand, yeah. like whenever we run the brick press, so the, the power cubes have batteries. Output, yeah. yeah, 12 12 volts. So 12 volts is a standard. And the size of the brick for the settings, that only adjusts the height of them, I imagine? Or? Just height, because yeah. the chamber is fixed otherwise. Yeah. you got 6 by 12, so the only thing you can control, how far are you going down with the main cylinder? So oh, until if you go down like halfway, like 4 inches, then you get 4 inches of salt, so you get 2 inch block because it compresses 50 percent you go down all the way so that you got eight inches so you get you get a brick that's four uh, mm -hmm. so that's kind of how it works it's just that one dimension that's um, but that's, that's controlled, controlled by the amount of material that goes into the chamber right yeah and then the, yeah when the pressure rises and the sensing happens then it turns off whatever yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yep so the only feedback so well how do you do that so there's like details about logic well how do you get that because you have to <clears throat> We can go. I mean, if you want to look at the computer, this, this is all documented. But basically, like when you have the drawer, you have to close it. You have to close the drawer. So there's a hole, basically a six by twelve hole uh, on the brick press. You got to close it. Close it off with the, the we call it the soil loading drawer. Uh, it's a thing that's on one one cylinder. It just moves back and forth. But you have to align it so it closes the chamber like right there, not like there or there. It's you know you got to close the chamber. It can't be like partially open. Uh, so the question there is, and that goes back to the logic, like how do you do that if you have only one sensor? Like one pressure sensor that detects only when you're at the end, one end or the other end. How would you do that? Because that's what we, like we, we said, oh, let's do that. That's, that's doable, but how do we do that? Through the simple logic of a microcontroller. How would you get it like in the middle? So you know you got a cylinder that travels back and you just forth. Take half the time. Yeah. There you go. You just time it. You say, okay, half the time we're about there. It's not exactly half because it's like not not exactly at that. But it, yeah, I mean, it, it's a very simple timing. So, so other people will claim, oh well, you might want to have like another sense positional sensor there, so you make sure you're there. But I mean, this is not rocket science. You know, you've got a certain flow you know exactly how much it takes to go back and forth therefore you take a simple ratio and that's it so that's what we have in the code go like about halfway now there's a little caveat there because the cylinders don't travel the same speed both way and why is that so a cylinder's got a piston it's a piston but it's got a rod on one end and you're pushing that piston from the bottom or you're pushing it from the other side where the rod is. So how do you explain why it doesn't move the same one way or the other? I'd have to see a diagram. I can't not conceptualize it. We got a pen? Draw it up on a board. Because <clears throat> that's, that's actually like that. 
try to build a brick press. Yeah, this is one of my fundamental questions. Yeah, man. Yeah. So if, if we, you want to build one, well, you got a cylinder that's got a rod. That's how it looks. This is literally what it is. And you've got some whatever clevis and whatever way to mount it here. But there's your fat piston, you know, the fluid. You know, you're, you got fluid in here and you've got an inlet here so you can put fluid in there. But that fluid, because of continuity, it has to, you know, go somewhere, so it pushes the rod. But it actually, the other, there's fluid here too, here around the rod. To make up for circulation. Well, they're actually not connected. That's what happens. So you've got fluid pumping in here, you're pushing that rod, so what's that mean? The fluid that's in there has to escape. That's a good pattern language. <laughs> there you go. But that's what happens in a double acting cylinder. They move two ways. You can move it one way or the other. There's other ones that you just move it one way. Well, the fluid still has to escape, yeah. but you're actually not forcing it the other way because it's not connected to power from the other side. Uh, but that fluid's got to go somewhere. Okay, so, so why we go at different speeds? Well, there's less volume of fluid in the in the one with the, that has the piston. Exactly. There's less fluid, which means so that the the side without the piston would travel faster. Well, actually, it's it happens to be the opposite of that. Uh, so why? So what's happening? So force of your cylinder is pressure times area. So where is the force greater on which side? Which side is it greater? On the left side. Yeah, on the left side, because you got the whole piston that you're pushing against. And if that rod is in the way, that area, that rod, which it's a 2.5 inch rod, it's a heavy rod, 2.5 inch within a five inch cylinder. Well, that, that volume is taken up by the rod. You don't have any force there coming from the fluid. So you actually have less force going back the other way. There's what? less force. There's this area, so this is um, that you know area one equals pi r squared. So yeah, r and that's just pi r squared minus some. That's r. Yeah, the other area so is pi r squared which minus which pi r r small r squared. But which direction goes faster? Ed? Yeah, but tell, you tell me. I, I, I thought I knew but then maybe not. So there's force and there's velocity. They're, they're not necessarily related. Um, you guys were saying that the right side went fast. All right, the, this. Just like an, an arrow, which way goes, which way is faster to. Uh, I'm going to say. It's useful to take limits, like if that rod was almost taking up all the volume, mm -hmm. how fast will that chamber fill up quick? Therefore, which direction do you go faster and slower? I see, so it's more about how long it takes to fill yeah. and the amount of uh, uh, the area that it that pushes with it. So it's gonna be faster. quick to fill and therefore quick to expand you're going to have less force, but you're going to actually have faster speed. Hmm. Yeah. And, that, and that's only because the relative load on the piston is low. Well, we haven't talked about what the loads are, because we're not talking about an external load. We're just saying an ideal cylinder, you're not really moving anything yet. Because the caveat there is, well, when you got so much rod, if your force is too low, like you might not be able to move something. So you always have to keep that in mind. Um, but you need enough so like when we're compressing okay so then the next question is when you're compressing which side do you want to press on the, the side with more force yeah of course yeah you want to use all the force you can because you want your bricks to end up at a certain psi so, you get so you're high. pressing when you're extending you're pressing block yeah so actually the the diagram there for your machine. So that's say that's the compression chamber, and you've got the big cylinder, which is that one up there. You got your compression chamber, and you got your cylinder. You're compressing by going up, so that your little cylinder in there connected to that rod 
you know, you're pushing up on all the area you have because you want that. This is like about structural strength. But you also don't, don't need too much, like you don't need 5,000 PSI because it turns out that actually like about 23,000 PSI is like, that's all we need to make them as strong as, as you need. Because think about it, if you like compress a rock even more, <laughs> nothing happens, it's already compressed. Um, but that's, that's kind of how it works. So if you consider that within your code logic, and it's very simple, so you basically are taking, so that area is pi r squared, but this area here, the available area for pressing would be, so a2 equals pi r squared minus small r squared. Small r is going to be your diam your uh, radius here, small r. Hmm. So that's, I mean, that's how much force you got there. So area and therefore force. So the way this is working, you're you're reducing, you're reversing the direction that you're pushing the hydraulic fluid essentially, right? Yeah. yeah. You're so always pushing hydraulic fluid in at high pressure. You got a valve. It presses. Bidirectional valves. Yeah. You, the valves that we use, unlike the actual uh, air cylinders we're using, they're both bidirectional. So you're actually opening it one way and opening up another way so that you're either feeding into one the bottom port or the top port so you got your valve you connect it to the bottom and top ports um, because you know the rod dimensions and the cylinder dimensions you can code that up saying okay well it takes me so long to extend it so long to contract it therefore I have complete control over like where this thing needs to go yeah. So I just wanted to sort of revise the, the question that you just asked. It's more so because I guess I'm thinking about inter uh, input and output pressure, right? It's like yeah. we're, when we're pressing, we want like the highest amount of output pressure. Yeah. So we want to press on the side that has the most surface area available yep. from the piston. But that means that we need to actually be pressing by putting pressure in on the side that actually contains the. Uh, uh, the rock, right? Well, no, no, no. Like, uh, it's gonna, it's gonna flow out on the other side of the yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I'm saying that, like, if we want a high surface area side to be outputting pressure, then while that's happening, we need to be inputting pressure on this side, right? And that's what we're saying we're pushing hydraulic fluid in here to force that to do that way. Well, this is just a gold. Go, go. <laughs> same drawing as this, because this is where the liquid goes, but is this supposed to where we compress the material? Or? Yeah, 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 sorry, that's, that's like, that, oh, okay. that is the smith <laughs> cylinder and that is the press plate, press that's foot. Um, yeah, I'm the only oh, okay, all right, all right. So all right. the press foot <laughs> actually attaches to this thing. Right, so the press so foot... Uh, this, is, this is a mouse trap, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So press fluid is actually here, we cut that, we actually get a truncated cylinder. We start with that, we get okay. that off the shelf. And then we actually drill a hole through it and put a big collar on it and put your press foot out of one inch steel on it like that. So it's a pretty big, these big plates, uh, one inch plates. Um, so, but where's the fluid going in? It's in the left port. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense now. All right, yeah, I was trying to figure out. So all of this is inside of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that yeah. makes the diagram make sense. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, <laughs> okay. And those diagrams are like. So let's take and take a look at CB Press V1708 on a on a wiki. But that has like, like for example, in the development template, there's like. Yeah, the design documents show it. I mean, there's all the details there. Like, okay, you gotta move the cylinder off, over. You measure the time it takes. You go halfway to close the chamber and so forth. But all you need is like the big point of that is you just need one pressure sensor to do it, um, and that's the thing there. We started not with a pressure sensor, but with positional sensors. So, okay, when the drawers close off or it's at the beginning, or it's at the end, we would, uh, well, we actually had both the pressure, sorry, both the pressure sensor and the positional controller. And we, then after thinking about it, it's like, well, why do we need that more hardware? And then you gotta adjust it, you gotta make sure it's like right there. 
why do that if you could just measure the time and take one half of it? So that was obvious, but not obvious up front because, you know, didn't really appreciate that or maybe didn't think about it enough. But, you, but it's reliable motion, like you know how much fluid you have and except maybe like if you've got like super, super fast motion, like you got so much fluid, like maybe like a hundred p, like hundred horsepower. Like typically you run it on one, like 25 or 50 horsepower. But if you have even more, that means the velocity of that cylinder is gonna be like way high. Yeah. In which case, uh, that time, in terms of how quickly the solenoid closes, which is about 50 milliseconds, it's a fraction of a second, but if you're going super fast, that may mean like a half inch difference where the cylinder ends up. So it's like at the very, very, very high, high speeds, which we never really uh, did that, but there would be a limit. Yeah, there you would need a positional sensor, positional sensor, and probably stop like a little before so you know that. Yeah, uh, but. What are the so? What do you guys want to do in terms of the most practical things to do? We've got the solenoid valves. Uh, let's see. Hampus, you wanna? Should you marry me? On it? Can you talk more about this? Sir? Mm, yeah. Let's, see if I have to let's uh, boot up that Zoom meeting. All right. So I'll say that. Because uh, I want to figure out what's most useful to do in terms of what we can do next week. So I've been thinking to myself, like, what am I going to do when I leave here to make sure I don't forget everything and that I add practical value to my life that's transferable to others? And I've decided that one thing I want to do is to make a wood chipper mm -hmm. based on, you know, the combination yep. of the shredder, the hydraulic shredder, and the CD press. Like, I know I'm going to need to build a big copper. You know, uh, so the container and the structure might be similar to the CED press, and the function may be similar to the shredder. Different blade design. Mm -hmm. But I got a lot of wood. <laughs> I got a bunch of trees on my property, mm -hmm. and I want to make mulch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, mulch is very useful. So I'd like to be able to combine these two concepts together to make a, a open source wood chipper. Right? Yeah. Um, and so the elements that I still don't quite understand are like. The, the actual hydraulic system design is an hour cube, right? Because it doesn't matter right. if I have a big steel structure with a little blade on it. It's a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so I definitely want to, and now the power cube is central for that. Right, right. It's a traditional wood chipper design, so I'd like to have a power cube that I yeah. can use to go power other things as well, right? Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, so separating those functions, I think, makes complete sense, and I'd love to be able to do that. So I definitely want to learn power key design, hydraulic system design, and the controls so that I can have some transfer. Right. Go do something else, you know? Right. The controls, I mean, if you're talking about a, sh a chipper, I mean, you don't need the automation there. Yeah. So, uh, but you do need the power the power cube infrastructure. So maybe we should start by talking about what, how do you design a power cube? What's all required for that? Yeah. I'm on board okay. because if I want to add a remote control to light track, yeah. I need to understand the power cube as well. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to power cube on a wiki and go through the basics of it. Um, and let's see. So, so in terms of time, it's noon time right now. What are we doing here? So. Uh, we want to put a time limit on how much we're talking here in class, and then do we actually want to t go out there and take the components there and start putting one together? I mean, that's different than what we were talking about, which is to build the controller for the brick press. So, I mean, what do we, what do we want to be doing? Democracy. Because <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it's up, I mean, really, it's up to you guys, because I mean, I've built plenty of uh, both. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting to what kind of knowledge can be best transferred, like being hands-on, and I have a feeling that just understanding the hydraulic system and what goes it goes into making that is interesting. So maybe um, the automation and the instructor for Arduino, we cannot Google in a way, like like you know, and then solenoids have a fair grasp of by now, you know, uh, or the relays and such. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Right. So, so I would say like uh, understanding how to uh, make a hydraulic system run and mm -hmm. then pepper it with the microcontroller stuff. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Say, there's another element though too is that like the the uh, the CD press is sitting outside exposed to the elements and so I know even in the control system design. What the manual part is it? Right. I'm sorry. Didn't, uh, oh, sorry. He's sorry. He's, uh, he's speaking lines, generally. Lines brought brought it in the workshop. Yeah, I'm just saying generally though that like the elements inside. But he's not no. talking about a specific CB, except that when you use it, you're using it outdoors. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that when we did like the electronics and the control system design for the 3D printer, you know, we weren't making sure that the enclosure was weatherproof or mm -hmm. anything like that, right? But there are different considerations for the CB press that I think are transferable to other types of systems that are yeah. So I'd like, you know, like this. Oh, there's a lot that I saw I'd love to for sure. Yeah, I mean, the short answer to your question about weatherproof, like the metal you could keep up there and the hyd hydraulic solenoids, they're all waterproof. Like all the hydraulics, the really good thing about them is they're extremely robust. They're all enclosed. The fluid is inside. It's self-lubricating. It's not like an electric motor. Like if you put an electric motor out there, you better make sure that's a waterproofed electric motor and all that. Um, here, like dirt and water, do not matter because I mean, hydraulic equipment is typically designed for that kind of environment. You got heavy machines that are in the dirt and dust and elements. You go underwater. Yeah, they're waterproof. I mean, they they got rubber seals around all the shafts and everything else. The hoses are self-contained, and naturally, you have to be because otherwise, fluid would be leaking out. So, by definition, hydraulic systems are watertight. Well, right? if you put it under the ocean, would uh, Oh, no problem. I mean, for example, do you see like those barges with a big ho uh, hoe, like dredging, like digging stuff up? It's going right underwater. Uh, like our back or whatever, you can be digging a pond and just digging from right under a pond because there's no fluid exchange unless you got leaks, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But short of leaks, you know. Until you get deep enough that the external water pressure starts to compromise the... <laughs> I guess the, the extra person would have to be higher than anything. Well, so that, that would be... <laughs> I'm not going to the Mariana Trench yet. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Manuel, to quantify what you just said, we, we're talking about 3,000 PSI for our systems. <laughs> uh, for water pressure, every 10 meters, it's about 10 PSI. So oh. you'd have to go down like a mile before you, you stop working or whatever. So no um, open source uh, <laughs> Chinese capital submarine systems. Yet. Not yet. <laughs> we're, we're not traversing the world yet. <laughs> yeah. Now the electronics, though. Um, this is the controller. How you connect to the to the actual solenoids that has to be waterproof. So you use like car trailer connectors, for example. Now this box. What do you notice about it? It's actually in a waterproof outdoor enclosure. So it's clear. Mm -hmm. There's no display, there's just a toggle switch? Yeah, so all we have there is there's a toggle switch where we're just selecting for which regime you want. One is like full brick, two is half, or whatever, three quarter and half, and then like res I think there's a fourth one that's reset. No, this is not connected to the current uh, LCD. It's yeah. just an Arduino Uno, and, it, and the Arduino Uno is sitting below your relay and that relay's got four channels because you got up down left right you got the main cylinder you got the secondary cylinder you need four channels of control uh so you uh you connect it you know power that's like power terminal whatever but this this is like where the actual so so you, you put in signal one way into the arduino and that's actually through these um these headers you put in you connect the Arduino. Well, it's actually self-connected already. The Arduino's on the bottom, so it's feeding that the signals through. The power, the power wires, they go here. They go to these external connectors to your um, to your relay. So let's see. Um, let's do. Um, let's just go into. I think this one doc might show. CB controller. Um, blah, blah, blah. I mean, these are the hydraulic solenoids. That's what they look like. They sit on top of this aluminum block where they bolt onto this block. There's a fluid in and out, which is the feed. And then there's these four, like one channel back and forth. So two hoses out of this, 
two hoses out of that so you put two of these va valves on top of this and you've got two bi-directional valves coming out of it um, let's see I mean there's all like data and all kinds of stuff on it but let's see let's see some pictures um, Ah, uh, here talking about the control sequence, like you know, that's that's what happens. You got to go through these steps. Uh, we talked a lot about these. Uh, use use these little LCD displays. We never implemented it. All we did was this thing here. This is like, this is where we got a selector switch. You got an Arduino. Keep it simple. Keep it simple for now, but like definitely would be nice to have a, a little LCD. Uh, so that's the brick brick press that. With this particular controller at, at like 18 horsepower engine, gets you like seven block per minute. Uh, here's like specifying all the other components that go in here. Maybe we don't, we don't get too heavy into this. I mean, but you, those are the solenoids. And those are um, effectively, you're talking about like a hundred bucks a channel. Pretty much comparable to a regular manual valve. They, they also cost about a hundred bucks a channel for like 10 gallons per minute. Going like 20 gallons per minute is more like 200 bucks, which is effectively like 100 bucks per channel. That's really cost effective. Like, it's not that prohibitive. It's, this block may cost you like another 50 bucks a channel. Uh, you got things like bypass valves, like before you feed fluid into the system, you want to have a safety valve, which if it overpressures, you set, set that knob on top and it will bypass fluid back to the power cube to the return. Got things like that. You got a little pressure gauge on it to know know where you're at. And you can see the pressure going every time you're pressing. It's kind of like low, maybe a few hundred psi. Then when you hit the pressure, it goes to like 2,300. You know it's working. Um, let's see. What's I want to show how um, in practical uh, in practical layout. This is kind of this kind of shows how it's laid out. So you got. Your power cube here you got fluid going into this side here you can see what pressure you're at it's got the safety bypass which would re actually returns around so that actually is accurate and actually uh, it's connected to these fittings here I've, this is like your visual bill of materials diagram you click on each one you actually get the actual part so you can learn a lot from this just study this this you can replicate exactly as it is this works Proven design. Pretty cool. Are there all those links? Or? Yeah, it's all live. This, uh, you know, we've done this. So you got your little pressure switch right there. Um, and that pressure switch, where's that? Um, uh, I think ignore those red wires. The pressure switch. Um, oh no no no, that, that's actually correct. The pressure switch, once activated will uh well what happens to a pressure switch uh no pressure is just a signal you're just saying oh do i have high pressure or not the, i don't know what those red, the red and black that's maybe that's power to the switch but the the way it works is you're either sending on or off to the microcontroller and when it's on because this thing is just binary it's like when you hit that 2300 psi and you set it there's a, like a little screw um at the top there, you can actually see that little slit. There's a screw, you set it in, and you can set it between 1500 PSI and 3000 PSI. You set it for like 2300, and at that point, it actually turns on, like conducts. All it does is either conducts or doesn't conduct. So it's just, it's similar to the thermistor where, well, it conducts proportionally to mm -hmm. tell you the temperature. Here it's just on off. Uh, but those wires would be going to the controller, and the controller says, oh, I got high pressure, let me do something else because the logic is defined as such. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, we like to use quick couplers. So like you don't have to, like if you're, this is a module that you build like in the parallel build process, like one, one team would build this and then we put it on, put it on the machine, connect the hose from the power cube. It's all disconnectable. You can uh, take it away. But this can live outside. There's nothing sensitive. Like all these components here are waterproof. That's one um, thing that I didn't know that I think was really important about the quick uh, uh, the disconnects. Yeah. Like the idea that they are able to isolate sections of the system while retaining the pressure. 
in yeah. all of the other lines, right? Because I was just, exactly right. I was like, I don't know if I can disconnect this. If there's going to be hydraulic fluid flying all over the place, is it high? Am I going to have permanent burns for the rest of my life, right? And you're like, no, these these will maintain pressure in your entire. And I was like, is, does the fluid go back to the reservoir and the power cube every time I turn the power off? How exactly does this work? But I think I got a better. They're full. Everything is full. Like. Uh, the quick connects the important point about them they're not just quick connects they are self-closing quick connects because you can disconnect something and it's going to leak on you these have ball valves with a spring that when you disconnect them the ball goes against the, like the ball gets pushed in when it's connected it goes against the seal when you disconnect it so you just got a little dribble of fluid um, you, see, you do see a bunch of leaks around here. That, these things, every time you take them apart, they do leak a, little, a few drops. They do have these other things called flush face quick couplers, which do not leak. And they're more like twice as expensive. Flush face quick coupler. They look like that. They're literally flush face and they also are spring loaded. They go in, but whereas like this would be 40, you could get the other one for like 20 and stuff like that. So, um, but not not too prohibitive that's it's still cost is pretty good so this is actually something that that i am curious about because like you know i think for some of the simpler applications like a shredder or a chipper or something like that not as important but if i'm building towards a tractor with attachments and all of my lines stay full mm -hmm. i think the sizing of the hydraulic fluid is important if i'm going to attach a, you know if i need to move the tractor itself that's one thing but then if I need to move the tractor and then power all of these attachments that we're doing as the functions, then the amount of fluid in the system has to be sized to be able to do that once I start attaching things, right? Yes. Uh, <coughs> that consideration is taken all solved by the size of your hydraulic reservoir. But remember that, okay, say you're going to pick up a hole, uh, like a backhoe attachment, and it's got big cylinders. But remember, all that fluid is in there already. So you don't need to, like the amount of change of fluid is only the differential between like the extended and closed position because you're if you're pumping it one way it's going out the other the only thing that's you have to account for is the difference in one way to compare to the other and that's only the diameter of the shaft of a cylinder okay. for hydraulic motors it doesn't matter if you're spinning one way or the other the fluid that comes in is equivalent to the fluid one way and the other are the same so that goes into like sizing of your hydraulic tank well say you do have like some big cylinder and you got this fat rod on it it's pretty long well you better have enough spare volume in your hydraulic fluid tank so that when the excess fluid from one side versus the other comes in you're not spilling your tank yeah, yeah. so typically we just go okay five gallons five gallons hydraulic reservoir uh, that's never been an issue in terms of, you know, like brick press or hull, like backhoe that we built and other things. So, but it's effectively, you, the question you ask is, what is the differential size of fluid as determined by what's the volume of a rod in your longest cylinder and times how many cylinders you've got, you've got to add it all up. You basically have to count up rod volumes. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, so it's essentially just an expansion tank. Yeah. Okay. yeah and That's not under pressure. It's open to the air. It's got a breather on it. So it's it's not pressurized in any way. Gotcha. Um, the high pressure is high pressure is going to be like beef like on the you know the, the high pressure side like before any implement like before the cylinder one side is high when you when you're spilling that's that fluid say into the or the fluid on the rod side that's going to be low because it's connected to tank whatever's connected directly to tank before the active element anything connected to tank is going to be already at low pressure so on the return size you can actually use like regular that's plumbing good. fittings okay, yeah. wow. um, and then i have a question so you said that all these systems are filled with oil and when you, you you disconnect these uh they're self-contained with oil yeah they now, are. whenever you fill it for the first time do you keep one side open with a special valve to push the air out or yeah yeah, well, if you close it and connect it to the tank, the air will just get pumped into the tank and escape out the breather right, of the tank. Right. That's all. Okay. Right, yeah. Yep. So, so it fills, you got it. It's Now it's active. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as the actual, so that's, I mean, you can copy this exactly as that is. You got the logic sequence here. That's what we currently use and kind of goes step by step. There's like four, four steps. Um, so in, um, let's see this controller. Let's see, look at the table of contents here. What are the important things? Um, know that we just saw this working design working doc um, that's repeated there let's go into this there's some pictures I want to look at some pictures of the actual implementation of it doesn't really show that. And there's another doc. Let's see, BOM, development. Working doc, let's see, development. No, I think those may be the same documents. So, so let's look at the actual uh, builds. Uh, let's just get some Facebook pictures. Yeah. Let's look at this one maybe. No, let's go to the actual build, build of the brick press that shows. Uh, the actual yeah so, so that you know yeah so this is the actual when we build that one we this is actually how let's see is there any better pictures here Let's look at the, the pictures folder. No, that's, that's old stuff. Probably most useful is take a look at some of the as built, like how the controller looks here. So uh, in this, yeah, actually we we changed it a little. Uh, that's that's actually an old one, but. You still have the two blocks with, uh, that's the solenoids that were not next to each other, but like one on top of each other. Here's the waterproof enclosure. So you got these hoses, the quick connects, that, that's how you, these, these two quick connects go to the cylinders. And then these other ones, this one here is like inlet, and I can see like the pressure sensor right there, which is just giving the signal into the controller. And this one we, um, we had the box where you actually control it like up, down, left, and right with the buttons as well. And we kind of got rid of that because we just put a button reset. You know, so move the, when you, when you start, you want to make sure like you lower your cylinder. So if there's high pressure, you lower the main cylinder and you retract the drawer so that everything is open. And we control that by the manual buttons, but we didn't really find a, great use case because that's only like when you're messing with it or it gets stuck so we just say okay let's just zero it and that's all we need it just simplifies the controller in terms of a feature that we didn't really find a lot of use for but after that um, we did yeah this is more like the mechanical stuff yeah and this is heavy stuff we got the legs um, and that's that's pretty much what the machine looks like the controller um, if you take a look at it it looks like it's mounted like right there um, we mounted like right on the side right now we have the same kind of like the one inch guide rods that the, the drawer basically moves back and forth and glides on these rods so we kind of have the same system as the bushings for the the CNC torch table where we just got a plastic 3d printed piece 
the bushing inside and then going on rods so you get nice straight motion uh, and then you got on top of the plastics so this is like the idea of like using both plastic and steel so that you got heavy bolts and another steel plate on top so you, you create the geometry of plastic but any structure because now here you need structure like you need that metal the plastic I mean you're talking about you know thousands of pounds of force that you're pressing you're you know the frame could be like you know the dangerous part is like jam, jam conditions like you hit a rock and then like you get all that force on a steel typically like you don't need all this mass if it's like just pressing well the press the press part you need all that mass in the in a vertical structure but under normal conditions like as far as the drawer moving back and forth there's not much going there unless like there's a rock that gets in there and you're you know you're breaking a rock and then you get the pressure spikes so you do need like like there plastic would normally be good but no not not if you hit rocks and you're chewing up rocks with this because it'll, it'll just bite through rocks and smash them so um yeah can we is that bad for it or can we no. smash them up? no i mean it's <laughs> It will always happen because I mean, it will happen here and there. So you better design your machine to be able to accommodate that. Um, and that's why it's, it looks like. But could it be used to just crush rocks rather than? Well, very ineffectively. That's not. I mean, as far as crushing rocks, you know, if you have a chamber full of rocks, uh, I mean, rocks are more than 3,000 psi. So, uh, the the force we're actually exerting on it is that. 3,000 PS, you got 20 tons, and you have to divide that across 72 inches, right? Six by 12 inch. So 20 tons, that's like, what's that come out to? Like 200 pounds, 400 pounds, 500 pounds per square inch that you're pressing on the soil. While you inside the cylinder, it's 3,000 PSI, you're spreading that across the press foot so you get less than 3,000. That factor means you're really pressing like five, five, seven hundred. That's not enough to crush rocks, but it would be good as an aluminum can crusher. So if you want to load <laughs> aluminum cans, uh, that would be a, you get blocks of crushed cans that you can melt down then for your further well, yeah, you could micro make, factory uh, operations. Something like <clears> a <throat> cardboard bale. Yeah, you could do small small bales of that, sure. We saw um, that video, there was a project, I think it was in like, uh, South Africa, where they were doing plastic. Okay, so let's move on to the power cube, because the power cube repeats like a lot of this, these topics here. Design a power cube. Yeah, can Any I questions on a CB press? I mean, we've got the full CAD, like we've got the DXF cover files that you would take to your local fab shop or on a torch table that we're developing. Um, we're finding out, man, like the belts, we gotta figure it out. We've got a little bit of backlash. Like, I think we can cut blades now. Uh, we're pretty good. Oh, uh, Ken, by the way, uh, any further uh, developments on the torch? No, no, not, today. Um, not yet. I, I, haven't, I wanted to film the cadet Yes, so we're, I mean, we're like getting ready to cut and we're good enough to cut blades, uh, so. I mean, you can take our DX, the ultimate proof here would be now, okay, D, DXF files from before. Um, how do you, okay, so say say you want to build this brick press, actually the physical structure. You, you want to find like where the, uh, where the files are. I'll just show you that, that's the, so go to 17.08, which is our production version. You go to the development template. You'd look at CAM, computed aided manufacturing. So this is a folder of files, which are two-dimensional. So you download that and then open it up. These will be your files for half inch, quarter inch, and eighth inch steel. So let's see. Um, Cause that's like the hopper, for example, is eighth inch steel. Some parts are a quarter, like the Hopper seat. Most of it is half inch, which is the structure. But you need that. But here, I mean, what are the DXF files looking like? They look like DXF files. So if you double click on it, what happens? You open you open it up in LibreCAD. That's comes stock with OSE Linux. Um, then you'll see this is something you can actually give to a fabricator. Here you go. Here's the hopper parts. Cut it out for me, please. And they do that. So 
we've got digital fabrication capacity here. Um, to do this like the half inch file. So, so these are cut out of like uh, five by 10 or four by eight sheets of, of uh, virgin steel. So that's like, that's all the parts. That's like the arms and drawer and this and that. And what you can do is uh, from FreeCAD, if you have the 3D CAD file, you can um, export DXFs and then get these files. So this, this all exists. You can actually take this to a local fabricator and, and pending like any like interoperability issues, they'll cut it for you right away. Like last time I took this, like some parts weren't showing up, like whatever, but um, there's definitely the file interoperability issues. Like DXF, you'd think that would be easily accessible by anybody, but there's different versions of DXFs and like depending on the year it was produced. So like last time actually we had some trouble, they couldn't get the part, so I had to like, okay, here's the file again, again. Um, but typically this will be straightforward and just get these things cut. On our torch table, like if we have a four by four by four area, we can only do like, you know, we actually wouldn't be able to fit those long ones because those are like pretty much six feet. So we have to build a larger table for that. Um, okay, but that's accessible. So if you want to do it, replicate this, uh, you can. Let's take a look at the power cube. Did you guys see this video here? That's that's a quick walkthrough of a of an actual build, but I mean the build, yeah, that's build is one thing. Um, but I mean this. This is not the latest one. The latest one is, this is like a version from whatever that was a few years ago, but the concept is the same. You always got an engine. The engine is coupled to a hydraulic pump. So the engine is just mechanical power. Could be an electric engine. You can have it solar. Like if you want to put a bunch of solar panels on your tractor and then have an electric motor or batteries, you could do this. Um, you could do a workshop to build a solar power cube. Just like really slow and right if you have batteries then you can have a lot of force I mean actually a, a battery powered tractor does make sense like put some nickel iron batteries on it and stuff uh, so like in a power cube you saw those quick connects so that all you need is like input output quick connects you connect to it that's like the pump mount uh, that's the pump and that pump is small but that handles all the fluid power that converts the, all the engine power to fluid power at 3000 psi you need hoses you need a oil filter to keep junk out the fan was cooling fan because the fluid gets hot it's only 85 percent efficient for power transfer so you're throwing away 15 percent we use a 12 volt battery like that so the engine is a core, like this one is a 27 horsepower. You could use whatever kind of engine you have and then size the pump according. That's, the, that's actually the fuel tank assembly. This is the hydraulic tank with a breather, like that's open to the air. Uh, and these we just hang. We've got plenty of these actually, like <laughs> in old power cubes are the one we took apart. These tanks, like we can put on another frame and make them work. Pump plate, so the, the key is you know, you have an engine, you have a pump, so you got to connect them together. This is when we made our own pump plates, but you can also get a ready-made, like a pump mount, because this is standard components. You can get a ready-made ready pump, pump mount with a bolt pattern that's like on the engine, and then bolt pattern, standard bolt pattern on a, on a pump. Control panel, actually, if you, if you look at that, it has three. I'll talk about the third one, the third... Yeah, so control panel, cooler, you got to cool the fluid, there's the battery there. Frame, I mean, we can weld that, we can weld it out of rebar. I mean, I'd actually, um, so actually the biggest difference right now, what we're doing is, this has all the components on it. Now we're saying, okay, let's make a cube with only this, with only the tank, fuel tank, hydraulic system, like the cooler fan. Um, let's keep the engine and pump separate because those are the things that go go bad on you. All the stuff here, what you see, plus the fan and filter, control panel. That's the engine mount. 
that's how we did it in that, in that case do that and use that for all the power cubes you don't need like five gallons you just need fuel and cooling and and uh, hydraulic oil you need that once you don't need to repeat that in all the all the modules if you're doing scalable power units so that's our next step okay. that's what we were going to do on this tractor do one mother with the hydraulics and the other is engine engine pump separated further because we know that the engines and pumps are the things that break the engine engine pretty much that's what's going to go out on you after a thousand hours these are like kind of like throwaway almost like throwaway engines i mean engines last thousand for engines like this five thousand for like a five thousand hours for like a better engine here we use the double chain coupler uh that's effective that's one way to do it uh right now we're using and we welded up that that engine mount uh, yeah so quick connect links you might have seen that on our chains um that's a way to get flexibility in the, in the mounting but we can also do the stiff like because there's not it's not too complex like stiff couplers work on this too lovejoy couplers which are those ones with a uh, rubber piece in between them we found that the rubber piece would melt out <laughs> so we don't use that anymore and then you got a suction hose on one side so you connect that to the hydraulic reservoir and that you want to be fat so you don't have any resistance because it's not under pressure it's like trying to pull it through there so you want it to be a nice volume it's a one inch hose typically that we use i don't think i quite saw the connection between the, the shaft on the pump and the uh, it looked like the, uh, so this is what we have there so the engine shaft is like right there yeah. and one half one sprocket is connected to the engine the other sprocket is connected to the pump and then you put a those two sprockets you just wrap a chain around them and then you have a little bit of flexibility there just like what we're doing on a life track the tractor wheel drive we're doing a double chain coupler so we have a lot of tolerance in terms of alignment so anyone can build this otherwise you got to be very precise like when you mount it it has to be exactly at right angles otherwise it will bind up and wear and break so this way pretty much a novice welder can you, you make your engine pump and yes it's a little little off a few degrees doesn't matter because that chain coupler it, it can move like that a few degrees to account for inaccuracies yeah that seems like just a good replacement for all of the hubs and yeah hubs. that is that is a good way um one danger point of that spins at high speed so make sure that it doesn't fly apart or put a guard on it uh here it's semi-guarded but be careful around that because okay so there's the cooler fan where the hydraulics before they return to the tank we send them through this cooler not on the high pressure side that thing is not going to hold pressure it will explode if you put it on the high pressure side you got to put it on the return line so the return line you go with a filter and the cooler and you're going back to the tank so that's the filter Then your battery, so you're connecting power to the starter motor on the power cube. Now in the micro track there, I'm just doing a pull cord. Um, it's not convenient. I, I actually don't recommend the pull cord because the pull cord, like I, I thought, okay, let's do the pull cord. Okay, that's a solenoid. That's your, uh, when you turn the key switch, it, it sends the battery juice to the starter motor. So that's a switch. That's a solenoid. That oil filter was for the hydraulic fluid before it returns? That's yeah. Okay. That was hydraulic that. fluid. Um, yes. Okay. So not for the engine oil? <laughs> no. Okay. No. The engine oil, that's your place. That, that's the engine oil fill. And you just replace that every so many hours. That's the... Oh, yeah. And you connect the negative. You can connect it right to the frame because it's the ground. Because the engine is already connected. It's lit laying on metal. So you just connect the ground, like put it anywhere on the frame. So you got the wiring, the, you know, you got to look at the wiring diagrams that we have. Uh, it's basically connecting a starter switch and then a connection to the solenoid where if you turn your switch, you got 
engine cranking. Oh yeah, so for the, the control panel, it's a detail of the, that's the switch. On the control panel we have the switch, the power, return, and there's that third one there. So what is that thing? Let's explain just this one. When you go left, you see there's three hoses. So, so the third one is the, called the case drain, so this small one. What happens is some small motors, not no, various motors, various motors, have a small lubricating fluid return. That's kind of like the way it does its internal lubrication uh, without going into the details. But some motors have three, three outlets, too big for power and return. If they're bi-directional, they're either power or return, depending on which direction they are. They have a third one that's just a, just a small trickle of fluid that's used for lubrication internally. I don't really understand the detail of that, but it's just like that. So uh, the control panel there has three, three of these connections because some hydraulic motors do have the third outlet. And for which reason, I was very explicit, the next, yeah, the, the motors I'm selecting right now, the ones that we use on a, the live track, yeah, they have three connections. They do, so we need this. Um, it's much more convenient to have two so that I mean third one is just more plumbing like you try to keep it as simple as possible like three is you know 50 percent more than two in complexity so just try to At keep it simple the... <laughs> yeah um, make it really transparent and simple you can connect your hoses quickly and these don't reverse they're always one is always power and the other one is always return this is not bi-directional uh, there's one power side and one return side Whereas on a, on a cylinders and motors, if they're bi-directional, they could take power through either their outlet. So uh, uh, a different solenoid later in the system redirects the liquid to push it back. Yep. A different valve, it's either a manual valve or a solenoid valve, would redirect it in both directions. The bi-directional valves, you can run them in two directions. Okay, so that, uh, I don't think I'm quite putting that. So on the power key, the fluid flow is always going to be in one direction, even if the fluid flow is reversed in the application itself. Yes, because the valves, they can, whether it's a lever valve, you can put it, push it forward, push it the other way. So in a valve block, let's look at a hydraulic valve, what it looks like. So if you take a look at any, okay, here's a, any valve, you know, you get this at Northern Tool, and as I said, about a hundred bucks, things you look for, how many gallons per minute, that's like the biggest performance factor, 3,000 PSI, 18 gallons per minute, hundred bucks, all right. Well, what's the, these are the work ports, these top ones, so depending on which way you press the lever, power will go out one and return in the other or reversed. Now the inlet and outlet are always the inlet and outlet, so that would be like in. You cannot put like the return there, it won't work. So while you have one directional motion through it from the inlet outlet, the work ports can reverse through the lever. Yeah. 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 Okay. And that applies to whether this is a, a lever valve or a solenoid valve. So Northern, we've gotten stuff from Northern Tool. Once again here, where are the connections? These, these are just the solenoids and they, have, they always have a base plate. So in a base plate, you'll have a similar thing. This is like a valve. So you have in and out. So whichever, you have to look at what the ports are labeled. There's in and out, like inlet and return. And then there's the work ports. The work ports are the ones that can go either one way or the other way. Yeah, but the in and out are always in and out. So that's a bi-directional thing you can tell because it's got those four holes and four ports. You can get like ones that are unidirectional, which is basically like half half of this, um, which would still have in and out, but they might have like one, perhaps one one outlet. Okay. okay that makes sense. 
So that's the power cube, and we've gone through different versions where actually in the early, in the cube two, we decided, hey, wouldn't it be cool to do actual gasoline and the fluids inside the frame? We did that. <laughs> it works. It's much harder oh, to do. Oh, right. <laughs> it yeah. it's, looks neater, but it's too much work. That's a lot. Because yeah. uh, you got to make sure all that is fluid tight, like when you're welding. So you got to be really good at welding. Yeah, there's like four, six, ty four times as many like seams or whatever. It's in, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, a lot of seams there. Um, so you're. Uh, there's no battery charging on here. The battery is used for the fan and the controls, right? So it has to be charging, out. yeah. So the engine typically charges it. Typically, these engines would have charging, like 10 amps charging, so you can run the fan and then crank it. Okay. Yeah, they do. Because typically, like if you use, uh, these are like lawnmower engines. Typically, lawnmowers would have things like fans and lights, so okay. they got to charge. Yeah. Okay. Except for like the small one that we have right now, the 18 horsepower on the micro track. Mm -hmm. um, the charging there is like a couple of amps, so it wouldn't be enough to run our run our fans. So that's actually a problem uh, where that the microtrack actually right now is running without a fan. So you can only run it for so long be before it overheats. Right now, you have to add like a like a PV panel or something or or a different engine. I mean, they have 18 horsepower engines like that that have good charging. That those particular ones they only have like a couple amps charging. So. Um, yeah, if we look at... One other question? The, yeah. The hydraulic pump, is that just pretty standard for all applications? It doesn't matter if it's... Yeah. You just kind of max it's up... It's pretty standard. Yeah, if, so if you want to go, uh, we get all this stuff at... So surplus center, like so if you get into the practice, surplus center is a pretty good place. Um, surplus center, hydraulics. This place about three hours from here. But you know, you go to shop by category and go you go to hydraulics, you got all the stuff, and you take these so it's got motors, you got all kinds of motors, you got fast ones, you got wheel mount hydraulic motors, which kind of look like the ones we have, they're like really strong. You've got pumps, pretty standard gear pumps, very simple. Uh, it's basically gears meshing against each other, and that gets the high pressure so. We typically get this style. You can select it by what kind of shaft you want. What what kind of shaft do you want? There's keyed, splined, tapered, tang, <laughs> other. Do you know which one you want? Probably tapered. I'd want a splined one because you can just this splined is a geometry. So if you look at yeah, yeah, yeah. but why? Because you just put it on, no keyways. Okay. Keyways are a pain. Yeah. Why not just let the geometry handle it? Because the geometry handles the force. You don't have to have this tight key that you got to put it in there and then it gets all tight. The tapered ones are cool. They have a keyway and they're like hard to get off too. Yeah. <laughs> like you've done it. The spline, you just take them right out. Okay. So if you look at the detail of the, the shaft on that, you can see the splines. You'd like that. Um, and then okay. just have a, a similarly sprocket that yeah. slide on. Yeah, that's, that's the disadvantage. you got to find a sprocket that's that, and if you want to need to weld it to something. Like, for example, we had to make our chain, double chain couplers. We took a sprocket and welded it to that splined sprocket. But that's yeah, yeah, yeah. relatively easy because you have some tolerance in terms of the angle. Mm -hmm. So it's not too bad because you got the double chain coupler allows you. It's, mm -hmm. it's a good way to go. Otherwise, you could break your weld. Right. Yeah, I mean, you'll put a lot of, you know, a lot of stress on the shaft. If it's not straight, you'll stress the bearings and your pump will leak and break and stuff. So the, the kind of motors we get are typically, they, they look like this. I mean, they've got in port and out port. How do you tell which one is the in and out? Well, this one is a, a, a keyed one, which I wouldn't get. Um, they got one side and the other side, you'll see that one, one side, the hole will be much bigger. The other one is smaller, so which one is the inlet versus outlet, high pressure, low pressure? Big one is inlet, and why? To reduce the pressure on the structure itself, the surface. You reduce 
drag but why like because uh, what's happening here it's the pump can you know why why you want the big one I'd just say if you're trying to increase pressure then you want the outlet to be smaller on the inlet you got suction so you don't really have a lot of pull there so you want a large diameter so you don't have a lot of resistance on the pressure side the smaller the hose is the more pressure it can take um, like the one inch hoses yeah I mean they're they have to be much thicker because they got all that surface area so but mostly it's for the suction the suction line is gonna be big because you don't want it to collapse on you like it has to be reinforced but if it was a small diameter you'd be sucking on it so much that it tends to collapse so it has to be like wire reinforced and larger so it doesn't collapse on you and has good suction um, well so you have little reason anyway the big big part is suction always on these pumps um, how much it's like 100 bucks man that's it it's pretty affordable uh, the size we use, how would you know what size? Okay, so these are like 0.2 cubic inch. What kind of size do we want on this? That's this is uh, this is now getting into design. How do you know? Like, and how do you know how many gallons per minute do you want? Like, how many gallons per minute can your engine do? Well, they do have uh, they do have actually calculators here. We actually refer to that. So here would be like technical help. Let me get some technical help on calculators. Gear pump, horsepower, gallon per minute, RPM. Like this, you start with a pump. So you want to say, okay, what pump do I want? So you'd go, first of all, you select your engine. So, you know, say we use a small 18 horsepower, and like, you know, the micro truck. So you say you got, so what do you got? Horsepower to drive hydraulic pump. Um, you're trying to find out pump displacement. You can go with, let's see, pump flow rate. You can start one of two ways. You can go, if you want a desired flow, like the starting point is like about one to one, like one horsepower to one gallon per minute. Like start with that, it's not actually that. So, but say we want 10, like what's, what are these quantities like gallons per minute? I know that like we want, we have, so I can tell you we have like 10 gallons per minute, 10 to 20 typical, but let's say you, st you start playing with these numbers and you, you try to look for what makes sense here. System pressure is 3,000, so you calculate, and you need it'll tell you the motor required. Oh, okay, that's going to be 19.4 horsepower. Um, so yeah, we say okay, if we wanted to get 10 gallons per minute, that 18 horsepower motor would be like just about good if you only go say up to like 2,800 psi, which is still plenty. As long as you're like above 2,000, you're pretty good. Um, so 18.2 horsepower. That's what we get, 10 gallons per minute. So how do you know what pump's gonna get you 10 gallons per minute? How do you do it? It's pumps, pumps rotate. That's with the cubic unit? Yeah. Is that per revolution? Yep, so that's the displacement, how much it pumps every revolution. Yeah, and I think they tell you, if you got like desired flow of 10 gallons per minute, Operating speed is 3600 because that's okay. What are the these engines? They're typically like 3600 R, RPM revolutions per. That's like a standard gasoline engine. Might be like 3000 to 3600 electric motors. That's a typical speed. Why is 3600? Because it's that's how fast electricity spins, like 60 hertz, the 60 cycles per second, 3600 cycles per minute. That's based on the frequency of electricity. So electric motors are typically like 3,600. Regular gas motors are typical speed like that. So 3,600 is the kind of number you want to remember. So you got 3,600 RPM. Calculate. 
Ooh, it's telling me 0.64 in cubic inches per revolution. So you go back to your your pumps. So you, you go shop by category, you go to hydraulics, you go to pumps. And you look for one, here will be displacement range. So you go to like 0.51 to 0.99 cubic inch per revolution. And you got these pumps, these various pumps. The only other thing you got to consider, so like 6.62 we, we wanted. Yeah, well, they got something close to that, like 0.61 right here. So you take one of these. So which one am I going to click on? I, I'm looking for the spline. So these two have splines. And what's the, there's two types with the spline. I like the splines. I need 0.61. Cool. <laughs> yeah, one is the one that's in stock. This is only two in stock. Um, and they're going to be either clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's determined by which way the engine spins. And typically, like, typically I think engines are clockwise and pumps are counterclockwise. Because if the engine is spinning one way, the pump is going to be spinning the other way. How do you determine that direction? Clockwise is when you're looking at the shaft. Is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? Uh, but these, the two, I think the da dash C will be counterclockwise there. Okay. Um, yeah, it says rotation CCW. Counterclockwise. Cool. We get this one. And then you look at, okay, what's its rated speed? Okay, well, it is 3,600 RPM max. Eh. When the engine is loaded down, it will go like 3,000. So, yeah, I think that will work. It's rated max. I mean... You'd you'd want one that's maybe like rated for 3600, but these these ones we actually do use, and I think they seem to work well. They don't tend to break, so we do use these, and they work well. Um, well, but no, this one's saying it's only like five gallons per minute rated. There's like some discrepancy here. Yeah. It's not good. How do we get the other number before? I don't know. The calculator is not well. It tells you right there what its rated flow is, so you you kind of have to trust that. Um, it tells you what it is given that RPM max. So what it's saying is actually at 36 RPM max, it will get you 8.84 gallons per minute, which is close. We said nine gallons per minute. We were looking at 10, so it's like 10% off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you, now you want to go higher. You you go to the one, and typically from experience, we kind of get these ones that are more like um, around this range. The gallons anyway. per minute specification. Maybe you said that, but how do you get to that answer? Yeah, gallons do, per minute. It has to do with how quick the, 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 yeah. the shaft is moving. You're going to look at, okay, so now you've got a hydraulic motor, and you look at, okay, what, it's, what is its rated gallons per minute? Because you want to drive that motor. Okay, it so has you, to be scaling, right, right, right. Yep. And if you've got four of them, you need four times that. Yep. So there you go. You select your pumps, you select your motors. I mean, the way I do it is, okay, I'm going to start with, okay, I get, I'm getting this engine. I want 20 horsepower. I want 80 horsepower. The way I look at it is you got two practical options, 18 and 27 horsepower. Like those are super, super common. The lowest cost per horsepower. Um, and on a wiki I record this, it's like motors or engines. I looked at this like forever. Look at what you got. I, I broke it down for gas engines. You got diesels. These are more expensive. But the bottom line is what's the least cost per horsepower and when you start looking through all the sourcing out there outside of now making your own in the future in your future the ones that are like 19 are the like 18 19 are super low cost like 20 per horsepower whereas if you go up to the 27 you're almost double that you're like 36 per horsepower so well what do you want to do? You want to multiply a few smaller units. It does make sense for cost-wise. It means you got more units. But if you do the mother power cube and have just the engine pump combinations, that's that's pretty effective. So you kind of have to decide what do you want. You want like one engine at 27 because I don't want to mess with two of them. You make your choice. But in a current one, we were looking at actually four of the 27 horsepower simply because we already have four of those 27 horsepower engines from old power cubes. 
So we were saying, okay, 100 horsepower, that's cool. Uh, we can have like, whatever, 50, 50, 60 gallons per minute altogether. And then you have to decide, like if you look at, look at the, the actual valves, they're typically in a 10 to 20, uh, there's details, but you can set up your drive to make sure that the, the valves you have match the gallons per minute of what, you, what you've got going through them. Like you'll go to, so we talked a little bit about, here's your hydraulic pumps, say like 10 or 20 gallons per minute. You've got valves, okay, directional control valves. You got maybe the skid steering drive, um, these kinds of valves. You look at their gallon per minute, so you want more than 0 to 10. You want like 11 to 16 or 17 to 30, uh, those two sizes but you take one of these uh yeah they're like 346 about 170 per channel but these are like 25 gallons per minute 3000 psi double acting cylinders uh and the only caveat on valves is you have to pay attention to whether you're driving a cylinder versus motor now what's the difference motors have inertia they spin so when you release the valve, you want to make sure the valve design allows the free spin. And a valve that does allow the free spin, as opposed to like locking it and it stops dead short, that would like blow things up because if you've got heavy, like say you're spinning like a hammer mill fast, you got all that weight of that rotor, if you try to dead stop it, uh, that's a lot of pressure spike somewhere. So you want to make sure that when you hit it to neutral the neutral is free spinning and that's what motor valves are the cylinder valve this is this one says cylinder uh, means that back in neutral position it locks so that, that would like dead stop it wouldn't work for that application uh, for a cylinder since a cylinder dead stops that's fine without much inertia typically um, you might have some if you're moving like a cylinder with something very very heavy and you dead stop it, it will shake you around a bit too, so you might want to have like pressure relief valves in that system. But for spinning things with heavy inertia, like a lot of inertia, yeah, you just can't use these things. They'll, you don't want to use, I mean, you could do that, this valve and just have a pressure relief valve that when it spins, the pressure relieves and it just like slows it down, pressure relief. That would work too, I mean, but that wouldn't be great design because you typically want to leave your pressure reliefs for uh, they generate a lot of heat so every time you'd be stopping something you would be generating a lot of heat because it's basically like the way they work is converting like whenever something's uh, restricting something it's turning that fluid flow into heat so if you can accept that heat that's fine if not if you're like stopping and going <laughs> you're trying to stop and go with a uh, cylinder valve on a motor that spins fast, it would build up a lot of heat, it might overheat, in which case you want to use a motor valve which free flows, you can free spin. That, that's like the main distinction that we pay attention to, like get cylinder valves for cylinders, get motor valves for, for spinning motors, typically. So like on the, on the tractor for instance, so going from uh, moving the tractor forward to going into reverse, there's no real time delay that you have to worry about, anything like that, you can just, it's just the, uh, the valve has to Able to, to handle the, the, the valve well from going forward to backward the inertia change in a 180 degree change is huge it's a big spike so you can't do that without going through a pressure relief valve because yes bobcats go like you can go forward and immediately backward but there's like a little slowdown and then you go back it's not like it's not like that oh yeah, sure. like beat you around quite heavy it will be very very uh large forces on a on the components this is so what you do there you got to get one of these valves here which are cushion valves bi-directional valves they look like this uh, but but we work at 1500 to 3000 psi you select this one what that means is that you got in and out for both of the like say this is connected to the wheels, so your one motor, well, so motor is connected on the other side, that means it's got, it's got two in, in and out, you got in and out to it, 
whenever you reverse direction, depending on how you set the pressure using these knobs, it'll just bypass that. So you slowly, like slow down and then go back. If you set it to like 3000 PSI, it will be like pretty jerky. If you leave it at like say 1500 PSI, it'll be like, it'll just slow down gradually and then go backwards. So you might want to set it to the value that you can, your body literally can stand because it's heavy <laughs> on your body. <laughs> and if you have remote control that doesn't apply, you can put a lot <laughs> yeah. of force on the equipment, which I want to do that because I know that like when you do the foundation, say for the CD go home, if you go at it for like eight hours, you get seasick. I mean, it's heavy on your body. So I actually would enjoy having the remote control for the foundation work and stuff. So uh, just from experience. And they do offer that. For only fifty thousand dollars is an add-on to your bobcat. <laughs> wow. We can do it for fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. what? This gets really good with the automation and our tractors. We get a real excellent product opportunity there. Fifty thousand, like yeah, yeah. Satellite phone, like Google, like remote Google? control for um, you know remote control for bobcat. It's got some like AR glasses or something. I mean, they they're proud of that. You know, they're like. Bobcat skid steer. Oh no, these are toys. <laughs> Those are toys, but the real ones, they're like, they're pretty expensive. Even the toys were expensive. Um, the oh yeah, Bobcat there. Company right there. Yeah, I mean, this stuff is, they're not going to tell you the price. Cause it's, yeah, you know when they don't tell you the price that you get. Contact <laughs> us, request so quotes. <laughs> um, yeah, don't not cheap. Don't call us unless you have the money. <laughs> <laughs> We're not putting together a quote for this. That's what yeah. I think is expensive stuff. But like, no, you can't get a quote. Right. The track. I like this in tractor controls, and they're like so colorful though. Nice. Nice. nice, nice, nice. Have you so, seen that? Or have you seen the video of the guy who, who welded a tank in like the 80s in the U.S. on a tractor with armored steel, and he was like fed up with the authorities or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget what that's called. <laughs> No. It's in Colorado, right? Yeah. Well, like, uh, this opens up a whole set of new beginnings. <laughs> no. Yeah. Not. You can remote control it. <laughs> well, he was inside it. Yeah, so like, uh, Life Track 1, so, so this kind of a thing, that's for your wheels. Life Track 1, actually, like on a wiki, if you look at that, there's, there's like full hydraulic diagrams um, for like wheel drive. Life Track. How about one? No, I gotta put a redirect on that. It might need a capital. So hydraulic, if you wanna study this, um, if you look at this, it shows a lot what, it, what I kinda talk, talked about. So, um, well, I just, so in life track one, we had a two spool valve for cylinders two spool valve for the wheels and we basically ran those in parallel like so the one side is you're just setting sending the fluid to each wheel just in parallel you're just dividing the fluid and send it to each wheel we did have that little um, case drain thing I told you about you had to have another third hose there going into the return you had to go all the way back to the tank because there is no low pressure hose at the wheel. They're both could be either high or low pressure. So you gotta have a separate, that's why they're pain. Cause if you don't have a low pressure line, you have to take that line all the way back to the tank. So from each wheel, we've got this third small hose. I'm just saying that's kind of a pain. So try to avoid it if you can. Cause some engines just have that case drain, others motors. Some motors have it, others don't. It just depends on how they're constructed inside. Did, did you aggregate all of those uh, from each of the four wheels before going back to the... I aggregated them at a T, like you go to one side, then T out to both of them, and then did the same on the other side, so there's a whole bunch of hose that's required for that, yeah. In this case, we even had like a PTO shaft motor, power takeoff, so if you're going to do an agricultural tractor, agricultural implements have six spline PTOs, so PTO motor, you can get one of these hydraulic motors like these and you can connect implements, they got this six spline shaft, that's what ag agricultural implements are driven by typically. Hmm. And for us, um, like they typically, so there's a safety issue here, here you would have this shaft that connects 
this like on the back of a tractor to the implement that's where track like farmers get killed getting wrapped up in those shafts so you'd want to I, when i design implements i would rather have the motor right on the implement so you just have hydraulic hoses and eliminate the danger of somebody getting wrapped up in there so hydraulics lend themselves to that because you can put the motor right on the device and never have to take it off you mean or like in the middle with the shaft to install it or um i would do a mo yeah you could either like leave one of these dedicated motors on it or make this motor dis dismountable so you're not connecting the shaft you're taking the motor with flexible hoses putting it on an implement ah, ah. that's how i would design it for safety because this is a, a real uh, safety issue on farmers is like one of the most uh, dangerous yeah right and professions yes sounds like something similar to a power cube with like a uh, one of these pto motors inside of you know a, uh, a box with interfacing connectors on it would be useful all right so that it's it's a, it's a unit in and of itself like say I have yep. a bunch of agricultural implements and I have a tractor and I want to be able to connect them safely, I might have a cube with this motor inside of it that allows me to safely interface to the tractor and to the implement. Right. The power cube is already self-contained. It's got the two hydraulic outputs, mm -hmm. two or three, and the, the transmission is your hoses. So they're pretty safe. Short of like blowing up in your face or something, they're they're relatively safe. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that. The idea, the idea that you just mentioned was to take the to take this hydraulic motor and attach that to the implement itself, yes. as opposed to the tractor, right? Exactly. And I'm saying to make it easily interfaceable, we could do something similar to a power cube, where we encase one of these motors with its mm -hmm. interface and hydraulics, you know, to a cube, right? So if I want to, if I want to attach it to the implement. If mm -hmm. I want to attach it to multiple implements, I'd mm -hmm. like that to be portable as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you're saying like make this like almost part of the power cube. So you got this module on a power cube and you can take that over to your implement through flexible hoses, which are exactly. safe. Yeah. 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 That's that would be good for safety. Um yeah, so um the add PTO cube or something, you know, and just hook some hoses up to it, put some hoses on the output and set it on top of your implement and right and it's um and it's kind of like even s simpler than it sounds because all you could do is take this motor you know you add your 10 or 20 foot hoses you know 10 foot hoses to that and you have that as a unit and then you just yeah. plug into the power cube that's it exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah yeah and then on this you want to have probably what you're referring to is like a an interface plate that it readily mounts onto an implement so you don't have to like mess around trying to screw down a bunch of bolts exactly. yeah yeah and that's exactly what we did we put a a metal plate with larger bolts because those bolts there are kind of small and not that accessible you have to have a nice tight coming so we put a, a half inch plate on it big bolts and you have to remove two bolts to to you use the motor on another implement which is easy. or you can have some other kind of a quick connect or we haven't really done quick connects but on our on our tractors like right now we we've migrated to the bobcat quick attach meaning the levers that you pull apart and then the implement comes off uh, just levers what's bobcat quick attach that's very useful um, uh, what that means is effect like on the front of a bobcat quick attach well, So bobcats um, on the front, the way the implements mount, yeah, it's these levers, and then you can pick up any implement with them. So you flip the lever, this latch dismounts from whatever implement you got, and that's a quick way to change it. You're changing an implement in like a minute. Um, here they talk about a repair video, but that's what we have on a life track right now. These kinds of levers that you uh, push them up or down to release an implement um, but yeah that's just a repair video yeah. anyway uh, that's useful so like these quick connect mechanisms uh, the weakness of it is that uh, actually for future experiences like for very heavy things the way it works is this one inch 
one inch pin that goes down into like for example a bucket but it's got just this like the tip of it going in so I don't know that's not gonna hold if you've got a super super heavy implement because it's it's just this like one inch pin going into a hole it's kind of it can kind of be loose or come off if you, if your implement like bends any way at all because it's only going in like like an inch into into a hole sounds strange that would be this is how this works yeah it's I, I definitely did notice like I thought okay well, what if I'm like doing um, like a very big thing like the big trencher um, or something some implement that's just really heavy I mean the Bobcat quick attach doesn't really have that beyond like like a couple of thousand pounds it's not designed for like heavier duty use than that like even the buckets well yeah actually yeah even a bucket if you try to really work hard with a bucket and lift it with all the force of the live track the bucket came off using this it may have something to do with uh, the way I had the quick attach set up but if there's any flex in there your implements gonna like come off if you put too much force on it and that's that's like half inch steel there it's pretty solid or like 3 8 inch steel it's pretty solid but it's just not designed for like the suit <laughs> like if you try to scale up to like much heavier like, very heavy implements like what like a, I don't know like a big uh, big back hole in front of something. but like on these devices like the Bobcats you can only lift so much because that you start tip forward so uh, that's just a consideration if you're if you're trying to like maybe do like a front mounted uh, combine attachment I mean that would be a lot of weight uh, so now nah, you can't really hold it on that you'll tip forward so considerations but yeah we use this quick connect we could I'm, but I'm just saying the point here is I, I would like a uh, stronger quick connect than Bobcat standard for the kind of stuff we want to do um, okay so what do we do today uh, we're at 110 we've got um, what would you guys like to do what do we want to do out there in practice or do we want to cover more topics or questions uh, that's basics of just some of the components there's hoses a lot of stuff we use, the, the way you screw things together is just fittings, which are national pipe thread fittings. That's a lot what we do. There's fittings that have O-rings in them. We try to stick to the NPT since the O-rings are specialized and is more special. When you go to like shop for hoses, like hydraulics and hoses, well, you got all these pre-cut lens here. Um, so all the like you, this uh, surplus is actually a good study of okay here's all the things well you're definitely going to need fittings you're going to need like uh, maybe a pressure gauge pump mounts hydraulic hoses quick connectors hydraulic they got hydraulic tanks they got breather caps because of the pressure the the volume of liquid in your tank changes you got to let air in and out. Um, but you don't want dirt to get inside there so it's got a little filter in it that's that's like your reservoir accessories um, these are all just breather bowls. caps and you just like torch and bowls in your tank and then yeah these things on. yeah that's what we do um, for doing that kind of stuff we do like weld-in flanges they got that weld-in tank flanges so you got these things that have uh, you you torch out a hole and it's got this wider lip on it, so you put it in the hole and then weld around that lip. You know, uh, I do find the surplus. It's like this is applied hydraulics. Just looking at all the components that they have, and then say, oh, okay, where do I need that? And kind of knowing about it, I got all your valves. You got hydraulic solenoid valves. Like the, that's the ones they have here. They could come in as simple as this thing, and these are 12 volt five gallon per minute little one directional solenoid for how many psi 3500 psi man look at that it's a tiny one for five gallons per minute so while it's not big enough for what we want to do but pretty powerful. Uh, it's yeah it's still 3500 psi so then in terms of like if we want to do electronic control on the cd or something like that mm -hmm. Uh, do we have a do we have to do like a step up like a five volt DC relay that then is triggering the twelve volt solenoid and we have a separate twelve volt power supply and because we want something that yeah, and I guess you could do that yeah because you have a twelve volt battery out there so you can run that yeah well exactly so the exact same thing actually that we're doing on um, DC 
so so this is what we got like guess, so my real question is are there dc hydraulic solenoids that can be triggered by five volts directly from our universal controller that's my real question no not directly from five volt signal you have to go through one of these types these types of things and that turns on the 12 volt from the power like an yep so ssr uh say 40 d dc or uh, no solid state relay relay uh, dc um you need one of these things because uh, out of the controller these ones dd uh, so 3 to 34 3 to 32 dc so the little signal that comes that you can take high Arduino signal but on the other side you got 12 volt these are like rated between 5 and what 50. 5 and 60 50 oh yeah, yeah up to 25 amps yeah so the, the solenoids only take like a couple of amps two or three four if you've got multiple solenoids at the same time you know let's say three times two of them you know six amps at least um, that's you know that's accessible enough so from your Arduino you know you can take any pin literally any pin well it's got a bunch of pins you need one that's like signal pin and one ground pin and you connect them to the signal part here input that's all and then when we're sticking all of this inside of our waterproof enclosure do we have to worry about cooling or anything like that about what cooling like the electronics if you, got, you, know, cause you, got a nice you don't at the power levels here so you ask yourself cooling like how much current do I have well it's only like two or three amps for the solenoid valves that's nothing like once you get to like 10 20 30 you gotta start paying attention but at the low level like solenoids they don't take a lot of power we're cool like if you had a big electric motor yeah I mean this thing here is up to 25 amps at 25 amps uh, you probably like if this is rated 25 like with whatever this stuff is I would typically look at okay if it's 25 I would look at a heat sink these things do typically like when you look at the pictures on Amazon like they come a lot of them come with heat sinks like you see here like look at that stuff I mean they got that big heat sink on the bottom but we're not running them anywhere like like this stuff we're not running them at 25 amps. We're running at maybe like six amps. You probably don't need it. You'll you'll touch it and you'll see it if it gets hot. But no, it's, it doesn't. And these um, solenoids are they continuously on while they're fed power and then automatically shut when they're? Yeah, yeah, they're normally off, meaning that at power you you close the connection. It's okay, so it's only momentary as well that you would be passing current. It's just for whenever you need to. Yeah. To so. So the logic in a in a brick press would be well the cylinder is moving one way you got to keep it on for all that time so you're keeping it moving when you stop it that means the power goes off to that particular solenoid and we've got two of those bidirectional solenoids the ones um, they're like this but they're different they're different they're the black ones these are I recognize these they're, these are like up to 10 gallons per minute so they would actually work um, like these these things would work. But actually, they're a little more expensive. They're more like two hundred, uh, oh, and you, they, they come in AC or DC. So, if you had one twenty AC, you could do it. But I mean, we have twelve volts DC on the power cube, so we'd want to go to. Well, these wouldn't work for us. They're all AC here. Oh, the bottom one was DC, so. Yeah, this one would work. Uh, this is AC. Yeah, this one would work, yeah, and it's only ninety. And it already comes with its little thing at the bottom, with its power port. Oh, but it's only, wait, is that one directional? Or is it bi-directional? Uh, I think it's bi-directional. Yeah, I mean, it, oh, but it's only like five gallons max. So it's a tiny thing. It's a small, small one. But... If you want your solar power cube with very slow motion, yes, this will work. It's only 90 bucks. So, very affordable. Do you Jupiter notebooks, won't you? I haven't. Um, yeah, I think it would be 
a good idea to use Jupiter as one aspect of the, like you talked about, uh, every build is a fork and how Git is only like one small uh, aspect. Well, if you do all these calculations, I think it would be good to use uh, Python and Jupyter so that you know other people can change the variables, at, like your, your input assumptions, to to you know to visualize. Hmm. It's open source? Yeah. Uh, you can embed these in a web page. It's a little bit s slow. The best thing is just to use a Google Collab notebook, honestly. But we could, you could also host these on our surf, like, on our surf. Yeah. Um. Okay, I am attempting to synthesize all of this. This has been a lot. I could use yep. a lunch break. I don't know about yeah. else. Well, this is this was great. Yeah. This has been awesome though. I've learned a lot. It, yeah. it is, it's a little bit overwhelming. I don't know how to uh, <laughs> how to remember it all or. Well, yeah, all. I mean, save the G docs yeah. slides. We've got the. I mean, I recorded this so you can review this. I mean. It's useful if somebody will actually transcribe it and you know upgrade the quality, like take the information here and maybe make a shorter presentation you know, out of it. Zoom has automatic transcription now. You mm. just gotta set it. And okay. It'll, it'll export a transcript. Well, there's open That's source models to, to transcribe as well. That's, that's nice. Get out of it. The first work on my time machine was. <laughs> I'm working on the anti-gravity device first. Yeah. Um, now what do we want to what what's for the afternoon then? I will help with whatever. I want to get more hands on because I realize I'm kind of lack the physical grit aspect. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's a powerful realization. I'm happy to see you taking action on that, man. and I'd love to do my best. Yeah, let's do some you. lifting. You know, let's do it. Yeah. So what can we do in terms of? Life? Yeah. Power well, preparatory. Um, yeah. What we can do is, I mean, we've got all those components from the power cube we took apart. Mm -hmm. Why don't we? Um, I would say, why don't we mount a create the hydraulic part, basically the mother cube, and then create the there's the engine pump unit. I mean, maybe like work on. We can take one of the frames we have, which is which I already have been welded through in a workshop. We can take that and mount, try the mounting other components, and yeah, take one of the rebar frames, make the mother cube, like mount the tanks on it. We can reuse the same tanks, and um, yeah, I mean, uh, get hands on. It's actually like screwing things apart. Like okay, there's on the engine pump unit, you've got like okay, here's the key switch and stuff like that. Um, I mean, all the stuff that we talked about, but now, okay, here's the reality of it, and uh, here's the hydraulic fluid and the engine oil and switching and connections, which are wrenching and breaking apart hoses. Uh, or, uh, I mean, we can, the thing we can do readily is use the old components. The other part of going about it is, you know, trying to optimize it. Okay, here's, uh, here's the optimized system. But for a learning system, we can just say, maybe what we do is have this cube that's pretty ugly and maybe not streamlined, but it actually all works and it's like this education thing, hmm. which actually could be used. Like we can put it on a tractor and actually use it. It just won't be like clean and optimized looking. Um, and um, then use that. We can use that to drive the existing track. Like what I would do is take that power cube, connect it to the existing tractor, like have a, wire up all the connections and possibly with the solenoids and all that. Cause we've got all those parts, mm -hmm. and uh, raise the wheels off the ground, and then we actually use that to control the wheels back and forth, or we can wire up cylinders to be controlled back and forth. Because yeah. that's going to be my other question: is like when I go home and I build a power cube, what's the easiest way for me to test it? Because I need that hydraulic to go somewhere and do something. Yeah. And so yeah, I'm interested in like once I once I build it, how do I test it? And so I think that'll be good for us to have some application like the tractor that we can lift up and Yeah, the testing would be okay, so you connect it to some device and without you know even just take the cylinder 
and you just yeah move it back and forth or you know little exercises like okay here's the code and we programmed it to go back and forth maybe like oh yeah now it actually triggers by hitting the high pressure on a solenoid and just reverses by itself so a little piece of code that says okay when you trigger reverse and then you've got the cylinder moving back and forth you know that's an application of automation and that's that's all we do in you know more advanced versions that say in the CEB press but if you can understand okay here's how I connect all the components including the solenoids and here's I how I feed it some code there's a lot of stuff there quite a bit there so um, we can focus on I mean we can build the mechanical stuff we can um, do yeah I mean what do we want to do so the mechanical part is there there's the controller part we have parts for all these things so I mean uh, what would you guys suggest doing the mechanical power cube using the components that are there um, we can do that so we have to get at least some hands on see how far we get on that mounting trying to mount everything together yeah. like if, even if just taking those components you know tightening up the connections um, but put it in a, in a actually in a cube like if maybe we, we do like here's one cube here's the mother here's the hydraulics and we've got the milestone of okay we just done this mother cube to which we can connect a bunch of these babies meaning the engine pump units um, try, try to get there yeah I think that's like, a good idea because um, then it's scalable like you can have once you, you know how to build one of these engine uh, pump units you can replicate that pretty easy the idea there is just engine just just pump and then the two hoses that go in into the pump um, simple it's for scalability like maintenance because all the hydraulics and the fan and all that it's all a bunch of infrastructure the, the tough thing about the power cubes is that you got so many things in one thing so when you actually try to work on it like things are in a way that's why separating it is a good idea like if you really want to get applied with this and scalable with it you make the one one mother and then the babies which if they break which is what I mean the engine and engine is the thing that's going to go out on you so, sooner than anything else I mean the, the life lifetime of hydraulics otherwise it, I mean it's pretty long it's you know it's tens of years before they're going to go out on you so we want tanks so, batteries uh, controller and coupling basically on one cube and then you want another cube that's just engine coupled to the pump essentially yep okay. and that means <laughs> we're running both electricity and the hydraulics to the babies but electricity running electricity that's pretty easy that's wires as far as the fluid that's hoses that's easy yeah yeah that's right that's right for the starter, for the engine yeah because the engine's got its own starter but the battery might as well be on the mother because you just need one battery to start all of them you don't need a battery for each so that, that saves you the infrastructure you're sharing all that common infrastructure in one and you can make as many of these modular units yeah I mean let's let's try that try yeah. to get it as far as we can you have to send back the charging of the battery you would okay. yeah if you don't want it to run out yeah okay. yeah yeah right. so you have to connect yeah the the wires that are connecting um, yeah there's gonna be another charging wire that has to go back mm -hmm. okay. all right this is good I'm asking all these questions because I'm trying to see if I'm synthesizing I think I am so this is good I have all one right. more question the valves um, uh, what was the, the question that I had there was a terminology for the valves that I don't think that I quite got. And I know the principle was that, you know, we, we have our input and output hydraulics, and then the sort of what the bi directional valves have different outputs for whatever device you're trying to, to move. Like the, uh, what the heck is the valve? What kind of valve is that? There was a term that we used. There was a. a bi directional control valve? Okay, I might have been it. It's. Yeah. Uh, because valves could be single acting so when you go to surplus center you're gonna see like single acting double acting single acting is where it, you can only push it in one direction and does one direction okay. and then you have a plumbing that's related to how each one of them each one of them work we never use like single acting because you always like if you move something one way you kind of want it to come back yeah. <laughs> or like you want a motor to go both directions yeah. yeah. So, but how do you refer to like what I would call a load? The yeah, load. I mean, load, load like uh, so actuator. Like actuator, like the hydraulic cylinders are uh, known as actuators, and then motors are motors. Okay. So yeah, loads. 
So it's like when I'm talking about the ports on the valve, I'd say, oh, I have an input and an output port from the power key. And, and then the work ports. Work ports, okay, that's good. In and out, and then work ports. The work ports, yeah, they're both at pressure. But, yeah, so, so the bidirectional valve, it takes, it has one input with pressurized uh, hydraulic fluid, and then it can switch to either go through that port or that port. Working yeah. Port. Yeah. Yep. It's not like one it would suddenly other. suck back through that valve. We would instead just choose a new direction that would take it the reversed way of... In right. In it can send it one way or the other, but then the exit will go back to tank. So if you're using force upon, say, a motor, yeah, it will spin the motor, uh, but after that, because of continuity of fluid, you're always putting fluid into the motor, it's going through it, it's driving it, but then it's going then back downstream to tank. So it's continuity of fluid is the big principle here that it's a very simple concept, but when you end up applying it, it's like, uh, where's the return liner? You know, it's, it like gets, yeah. in practice, you have to think about it so that you don't have any like dead stops and make sure everything's returning back to tank. Simple concepts, but in application, it gets kind of tricky because you got to think between the physical reality and concept. And I think it's cool. It's analogous yeah. to electrical systems. Like you have to have a closed circuit. In order to closed circuit. It's the same thing. It's like you can make all the analogies. Like a um, capacitor is. They do have actual hydraulic capacitors, which means that you're pressurizing fluid and then it can actually be released you know so it's a thing that it's a contain physical container with a with gas in it that the fluid goes in there and it's stored at pressure because there's gas in there and then even if you don't have power that can actually release its force down down like complete analogy Re resistors um resistor that that's like a constriction constricting needle valve that's a resistor um, inductor would be a, uh, a flywheel, like that motor that's spinning, that's an kind of like the inductor in some way. Um, but the continuity of fluid is the closed circuit thing, yeah. Uh, very simple, but in practice uh, uh, can be tricky. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make sure I get some of the terminology down because that's one thing that I struggle with is like I understand things. There's a, a difference in your brain between knowing and understanding things and being able to describe it with language. And like I, my capacity for understanding is high, but I tend to struggle with putting things into language and that is uh, a part of the collaborative literacy you know, uh, aspect that I'm still working on. It'll, I'll be a better collaborator when I'm better at putting things into words that other people understand. <laughs> yeah, and a great way to learn is try to explain it. Like if you learn this, explain it to your girlfriend, and you learn, you learn, you might learn it at that time. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's honestly my metric is like I try to learn anything that I try to learn. I study until I'm able to teach other people. Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, one way too is like to use words that are like sort of visually universal. Like if you want to explain something to to someone, you have to put it in the context of like you almost have to paint out that thing in the right order. So mention in the context and it makes sense. And there's also a a notion I uh, let me see language. Let me see if I ha did it on the wiki. No. Uh, so there's for example caterpillar technical English. There's a thing called like a reduced, uh, reduced natural language. Wait, let's see. Does that exist? Reduced natural language. Um, controlled natural language. I ran into this concept. Whoa, that says. So, for example, Caterpillar, the company, heavy equipment. They create this thing called Caterpillar Technical English, which is a reduced set of words that you can literally understand in any language. Uh, how? Well, the concept that you're reducing the, the number of words into the simplest possible, like a reduced set that's simpler to understand, but it's maybe like not as accurate, but it's simpler to understand. Mm -hmm. 
That's cool. When I saw that the caterpillar reduced the technical English, I was like, holy cow, that's interesting. Because definitely we know that explaining technical things is difficult. And then if you try to do a reduced set, I thought, wow, that's really cool. Because that's exactly what we're trying to do with the open source technology pattern language. We're just saying, okay, here's like the main building blocks. And now you can create anything out of them. Like say the 500 modules that I talk about. That's really the OSC technical natural reduced language yeah, and uh, for machine making. Work towards like a, uh, a formal taxonomy which allows for systems engineering and eventually computer and machine interfacing. If you have this reduced language set and then you can make some sort of uh, gateway. Mm, then your imperative commands or whatever are very clear and if you, there's no, there needs to be no ambiguity if you have some sort of uh, computer interface or, or just like right. interface. Yeah. yeah, if you talk about artificial intelligence, well, that that comes into into thought here. Avoid the use of pronouns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the people using unique pronouns aren't going to like this. Well, <laughs> they're also going to call it But it's actually, uh, like, as pet people of mine, most people are like, instead of saying the name of the thing, they say it, you know, and, and they're not they have this picture in their mind of what the it is, but if it's not always when you're listening to it, it doesn't even make sense. You know what's even uh, crazier, which you might never come across uh, if you, uh, so I was in, you know, African American vernacular English has many different regional dialects, mm -hmm. and in <laughs> Philadelphia, there is a pronoun that we use, a join, and it's uh, spelled J-A-W-N, and this is a universal pronoun that can uh, be used to describe any person, place, or thing. This is actually the And so like if you come around my family for the holidays, they'll be like, hey, you remember that one John that happened at the John? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, and we will know exactly what we're talking about. My girlfriend, when she first started yeah. hanging around my family, thought we were intentionally trying to keep her out of conversations. <laughs> But this you know the <laughs> <laughs> but in uh, and you see in other places like if you go down to Baltimore DC up to New York people will say a joint you know they'll say oh yeah we were at the joint hanging out uh -huh, you know yeah. but it's a joint in Philly and this is actually a universal pronoun that's common in the regional dialect of, uh, of yeah. yeah yeah and if you know you know but <laughs> <If> you know, <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like it actually denotes closeness and relationship if you can understand what we're talking about it's because we have a personal relationship yeah Otherwise yeah, we're just yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah so don't use uh instead <laughs> Alternatively, you need to develop, like, uh, like between an instructional manual, you need to develop a context relationship if, yeah. where you can say John and they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah of course, yeah, exactly. Yeah. My, I know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> So if you go to Philly, then, uh, then you know what we're talking about. Cool. Uh, so 136, what time in the shop? Is that an hour from now? Is that not too much time? Not enough time? Because that gives us like two and a half hours before sunset and the temperature drops and we all die. Yeah, it's still an hour. You're okay. surprisingly warm here this morning. What am I though? But I couldn't really progress the uh, headings. Long tubes don't really go anywhere. And when you when you show the um, the torque wrench with the gauge, what's that going to be used for? So you have, you say, oh, you tighten that one down to say 50 foot pounds, and therefore you know. Go for the pipe fittings or the hydraulic fittings? Yeah. How would I use it? But, yeah, that's the thing. That only has a socket, the yeah. socket thing on it. So you need the open ended version of it, which uh, we don't have. So can't really use that on that. You can do it on bolts. Yeah. Like if we're tightening down bolts, whatever you're tightening down on an engine or whatever, yeah. like you can do that. Because all those. Every single bolt has a spec, like say you're actually manufacturing it for quality control, it will have a number, okay, do it to X, so that you know it's not going to come off. Because mm -hmm. you can over tighten and you can actually dam damage the threads, you can under tighten and it's going to get loose. Yeah, I went pretty, I mean I didn't use a hammer or anything, but I, I tightened down like five, six fittings. Uh, yeah, and then yeah. at that point like, 
you have to have familiarity with the amount of pressure it needs. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the torque wrench would tell you. I'm pretty sure I didn't mess up that. Any threads or anything? Wes, when you, I know Ken is going to be here until the 22nd. But what do you have planned? Um, I don't know. I'll be, I'll be by the 21st. Um, 21st? Yeah. So, uh, you have your car? do you have a, do you have a ticket, or are you gonna get that, or? Um, I'll buy a, a, a ticket, yeah. Where's your car? Because you have a car, right? Where do you park it? It, um... Can you want to grab the manual? Oh. You don't know? I don't know. You don't know where the car is? Was it a nice car? What the fuck was? What, what are you talking about? You like parked it at a big shopping mall? You're like, oh, I can't find it. Uh, well, one of one of my tires blew out and I and left it abandoned on the on the road on my left for a week, and I couldn't find it when I came back. Wasn't it like a BMW? Yeah. It was a 2003 